Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of John. Hello and good morning, faithful listeners, and happy Tuesday. Today we're going to be discussing John chapter 7, verses 1 through 27. And this is a, uh, a portion of scripture that people like to say that Jesus lied in this portion. So let's talk about this. Did Jesus lie in this portion of scripture? And uh, I'm already going to tell you that no, I do not believe he lied in this portion of scripture. But let's see why people think that he lied here in John chapter 7. So once again, this is John 7, 1 through 27. Feel free to pause the podcast real quick to go grab your cup of coffee or your cup of tea. And after that, let's go ahead and enjoy reading this together. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he wouldn't walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, or the feast of booths, was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see your works which you do. For no one does anything in secret while he seeks to be openly known. If you do these things, reveal yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus therefore said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast because my time is not yet fulfilled. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but as it were in secret. The Jews therefore sought him at the feast and said, where is he? There was much murmuring among the multitudes concerning him. Some said, he's a good man. Others said, not so, but he leads the multitudes astray. Yet no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. But when it was now the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never been educated? Jesus therefore answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone desires to do his will, he will know about the teaching, whether it is from God or if I am speaking from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The multitudes answered, You have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel because of it. Moses has given you circumcision, not that it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and on the Sabbath you circumcise a boy. If a boy receives circumcision on the Sabbath, that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely healthy on the Sabbath? Don't judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Therefore, some of them of Jerusalem said, Isn't this he whom they seek to kill? Behold, he speaks openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the rulers indeed know that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man comes from. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. Okay, so let's see what's going on here in verses 1 through 5. It talks about Jesus' brothers. And yes, we know that Jesus had earthly brothers because uh, Mary and Joseph were married. And they obviously procreated and had more kids after Jesus was born. Jesus had a different father than his brothers because Jesus' father was, you know, Yahweh, God the Father. And uh, Jesus' brothers... Their father was Joseph. But regardless, Jesus did, in fact, have brothers. And two of the brothers we know of for sure were James and Jude. It says here that his brothers didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So here's what's going on. They're like talking to Jesus, his brothers, and they're like, why aren't you like doing all this stuff publicly? Like all this, you know, all this like miracles that you can do. Why don't you just go to Jerusalem during this feast of booths that's about to happen? And why don't you go there and perform your miracles publicly to show that you truly are the Messiah? And I don't know if this was in jest or not. Maybe it was. But yeah, Jesus's brothers did not believe he was the Messiah. And that's a very human response. Siblings often think the worst about each other. However, I feel like because Jesus's brothers like grew up with him, they had to have known that Jesus was like different. So if you think about it, his brothers should have been like the first people to believe he was the Messiah. However, they did not. They tell Jesus like, do this stuff openly to prove you're the Messiah if you truly are the Messiah. 
So Jesus says to them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. I find that statement interesting because Jesus is talking about how he is submitting to the will of the father and the will of the father was not for Jesus to like go and toot his own horn. His time was not yet. And we'll see that Jesus eventually does show miraculous power. But that wasn't until much later, like practically to the point where he was about to die. That was when he, you know, raised Lazarus from the dead and did all sorts of crazy miracles towards the end because he was really proving at that point that he was, in fact, the Messiah. And there was less danger of, A, the Pharisees trying to kill him early, and B, the crowds trying to to crown him as their king, which those were two things that Jesus was trying to avoid throughout most of his ministry because his time to die had not come yet. So he says, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. So Jesus is like, because you guys haven't submitted to the will of the Father, you can go toot your own horns. <laughs> your opportunities are all the time because you don't submit to the will of the Father. And so he says, the world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Man, people do not like being told they're wrong. And people certainly don't like being told that they are evil. Um especially if they are. Now, I, I know that there are churches out there that are like, oh, you all are evil. And they like overuse the word to like bring guilt down on people. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about the conviction of sins. And if a person is actively sinning, they really, really, really don't want to be convicted of that sin because that means they'll have to change away from it. And if they're particularly fond of the sin that they are committing on a regular basis, then they especially don't want to hear that they need to change their ways. And that's why the world hates Jesus. And that's why the, the world hates the church also. The world hates the church because the church, the church's job is to convict people of sins and bring people to repentance. My mom and I were actually just recently talking about that revival that's going on in Asbury College down in Kentucky. And uh, I was extremely skeptical of it to begin with, honestly, if I'm being 100% honest, mainly because I know that revival and repentance go hand in hand. Like you can't truly have revival if there's no like admission of sins and, you know, turning away from those sins, which is what repentance means. If there's no repentance of sins, then true revival cannot happen. So my mom and I were discussing this and she said, no, like this, this revival that's going on in Asbury is students like coming to Jesus. It was like started because one student stood up and began talking about all these shortcomings that he had. And through his admittance of like, you know, his sin, other students started doing it and it became like this revival movement. And I'm like, oh, wow, that is super cool. But Jesus is the one that brings revival because he convicts people of sins. True revival happens through Jesus. But because Jesus convicts people of sins, a lot of times the the, the people don't like Jesus too much. <laughs> and I can say that even for myself, even when I was a Christian, there's been times where I've just not wanted to admit that I have a problem or that I am sinning in some way throughout the years, for sure. There's been times that I've done that, and I'm not going to air all my dirty laundry here on the podcast, but because Jesus tells people where they're going wrong, the world does not like Jesus. So he says here to his brothers in verse eight, he says, you go up to the feast. I am not going up yet to this feast because my time is not yet fulfilled. So the Feast of Booths was happening, and this was one of the few feasts that Jewish men were supposed to go up to Jerusalem and celebrate. I think it was this one and also Passover. And there was one more feast of feast of like first fruits or something. I can't remember which one specifically, but there are three festivals that Jewish men were required to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate. And this feast of booths was one of them. And it actually says in verse two that the feast of booths was at hand. So in other words, it was basically, you know, time to go up and celebrate the feast of booths at Jerusalem. And so his brothers go up 
to Jerusalem and Jesus stays behind. And he says, I am not yet going up to this feast because my time is not yet fulfilled. This is where people are like, Jesus lied because he told his brothers he was not going to this feast and he ends up going to it anyway. He did not lie. It says here, I am not yet going up to this feast because my time is not yet fulfilled. So in other words, what he's saying to his brothers, he's saying, go up to the feast without me. I'm not going up there yet. And he was doing that because he was going to avoid the crowds because he knew that people were out to kill him. And so Jesus was trying to to silently, almost secretly go up to the feast. Now, Jesus always followed the law to a T. And because God had said in the law that Jewish men were required to go up to Jerusalem, Jesus always went up to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. So this was no exception. Jesus wasn't going to break the law. He was just going to do it silently. He was going to do it not in a public way, the way his brothers wanted him to, because Jesus knew that that would just be nothing but problems if he did that. After the, the feast is about halfway done, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem as if it were in secret, is what it says in verse 10. And it says, the Jews therefore sought him at the feast. And they're like, where is he? Where's Jesus? And it says there was a ton of murmuring among the multitudes concerning him. Some said, he's a good man. And others said, no, he's a terrible man. He leads the multitudes astray. So there was a bickering about Jesus. Apparently he was like the highlight of this feast. Like all these multitudes were just like talking about him and, and, you know, arguing over it. Some were like, yes, he's a great guy. And other people were like, no way. Man, this is so funny. Like this is... Everyone loves a good argument, don't they? (laughs) I mean, this is not any different than what happens nowadays over some political figure or uh, over some famous person. This is the same exact thing, you know. But anyway, the multitudes are bickering about Jesus while celebrating this Feast of Booths. But it says here in verse 13, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So they knew that the Jews were out to get Jesus. They absolutely knew. And they knew that Jesus was controversial and that the the Pharisees did not like Jesus. So everyone was very quiet about their opinions about Jesus. Very, very quiet. That's another thing that is common today. People feel like they have to be silent a lot of times about issues because this entity or that person or whoever else is against their viewpoints. A lot of silencing that happens in the world. And unfortunately, the Jews couldn't speak openly about Jesus. But it says when it was the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and he taught. Okay, so I was wrong. Jesus didn't go in the middle of the feast. He probably arrived at the beginning of it. But during the middle of feast, that's when he went into the temple and taught. So after a couple days had gone by of this feast, then Jesus made himself public. And so he goes into the temple. He starts teaching all these people and the Jews are marveling. And they're like, how does this uneducated guy know so much about the law? This kind of reminds me of a verse later on in Acts. After Jesus ascends back up into heaven, the people of the time period are shocked that the disciples know so much about scriptures because the disciples were fishermen. They were uneducated people. But the fact of the matter is that the Holy Spirit is who guides us into knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. And that you guys know me. I am not educated like at all. I didn't go to college. I dropped out of college. Um, I was a hairdresser for years. And I just had a, a love for scripture. And that's kind of how I started this podcast was through that. But I've actually had people like concerned over the fact that I am talking about the Bible on such a public platform because they're like, you never went to school for that. You never got educated in the scriptures the proper way. So you should be very careful about what you're talking about on the podcast. And I, I agree with them. Everyone should be careful. It doesn't matter if you go to school or not. If you're talking about scripture, you need to take that as seriously as you possibly can. Because there's a verse in scripture that actually says that if you are teaching God's word, you are going to be judged more harshly than somebody who does not teach God's word. I have a responsibility of 
carrying God's word with honor. And anybody who teaches has that responsibility. Anybody who discusses scripture has that same responsibility, regardless of the fact that if you went to school or not. So after this, Jesus answers the people because he knows that they're like discussing his education, basically. And he says, my teaching is not mine, but it's his who sent me. So it's God the Father's. If anyone desires to do his will, he will know about the teaching whether it is from God or if I am speaking from myself. It's kind of what I just discussed a moment ago. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been given discernment to know whether or not Jesus's words are the truth or if they're not the truth. But they are, in fact, the truth. And the Holy Spirit gives us that knowledge. So then Jesus goes on to talk about himself. He says, anyone who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus is telling this multitude that's like listening to him that he is God. He's saying no unrighteousness is in me is what Jesus is saying. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm sinless. <laughs> and then he says in verse 19, didn't Moses give you the law and yet none of you keeps the law. So why do you seek to kill me? This is Jesus declaring that he is God publicly. It's also him declaring that he is sinless. And he basically tells the, the audience that, you know, you guys all have the law. You think you're righteous and yet you can't keep a single law. Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now, the multitude is upset because Jesus convicted them of their sins right here. You have a demon who seeks to kill you. <laughs> Uh, it's funny, but it's not funny, honestly. And so they're like, yeah, you have a demon inside of you. You know, you're speaking all this stuff about how righteous you are, but who's seeking to kill you in this multitude? Which is hilarious that they say that because at the very end in verse 25, they acknowledge that people are seeking to kill Jesus. They say, isn't this he whom they seek to kill? He speaks openly. So they knew they absolutely knew who was seeking to kill Jesus. And I'm going to guess that the Pharisees, because this was inside the temple, by the way, I'm going to guess the Pharisees had a lot to do with this, you know, saying who seeks to kill you when they knew inside their hearts they were the ones seeking to kill Jesus. And so Jesus answers them, I did one work and you all marvel because of it. And what he's talking about is when he healed that man on the Sabbath day. Now, if you remember, the multitudes were all crazy upset that Jesus did something on the Sabbath day, because according to the made up rules and laws of the Pharisees, people were not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath day, especially not heal. Healing was bad on the Sabbath day. In fact, doing anything on the Sabbath day was bad. You couldn't do a single thing on the Sabbath day. It was like total misery. Like, why would anybody want to celebrate the Sabbath day when you can't do a single thing on it? And that's not what God put in place in the Old Testament. This is why legalism is so bad. This is why, you know, adding to God's rules is just so, so bad because it makes God's word like total drudgery. And I mean, God's word is not drudgery. Like his laws are good. It says in, the, in scripture that his laws are good. It's people that make it complete and total drudgery. And I know this from experience. I went to a church that was extremely legalistic growing up and there was a lot of added rules to God's word. You know, uh, women were required to wear skirts and dresses and pantyhose. And we were required to not have any drums in our worship music. And we were required to do this and do that and go to church on Sundays, Sunday nights and Wednesdays, and then serve throughout the week. It was drudgery, a lot of it. And it makes you, it also does something else too. It makes the people who do follow these rules that aren't in God's word. It makes those people think that they are holier than thou. The fact of the matter is God is extremely gracious and loving and we have been granted grace under Jesus. We can't uphold God's law. We are that bad. So if there's somebody out there that is telling you that, you know, you have to do this, 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 and this in order to get on God's good side, um, I ask you to analyze what those things are and study to see if they're actually in God's word or not. Because if they're not in God's word, it might be legalism, which is what the Pharisees fell into. And so Jesus says, you know, the, the Pharisees are so legalistic. They, they are so upset 
when good things are done on the Sabbath day, but yet they go and circumcise a young boy on the Sabbath day so that the law is not broken. So in a sense, they're being hypocritical because they're doing work on the Sabbath day. Like a good work because it's part of God's law, right? But they're still working on the Sabbath day, and the, but yet they're mad about Jesus healing on the Sabbath day. So Jesus says, don't judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Use righteous judgment. You know, the whole thing right now going on where it's like, you can't judge anybody. Well, Jesus literally tells us right here to use righteous judgment. And if you are a Christian, it is actually your right to judge the church. It is your right right now to make sure that nothing stupid comes into your church. But yes, I do agree that as Christians, we should not be judging the world. There's actually a verse specifically that says that. Paul says that God is the one who's going to judge the world. It is not the Christian's job to judge what the world is doing. It is only the Christian's job to judge their church, their church community. That's it. So Jesus says, don't judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Therefore, some of them of Jerusalem said, isn't this he whom they seek to kill? So they admit it right there that uh, they know that somebody is trying to kill Jesus. And they're like, he speaks so openly, but they can't say anything to him. That's what they say. So they're acknowledging that Jesus is speaking so openly in the temple, but yet the Pharisees are silenced. They're silenced. So now some people are picking up on the fact that Jesus might be the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? Like, look at this. The brothers at the beginning of all this were like, Jesus, go do this stuff openly so that people know know that you're the Messiah. But the way Jesus handled this and what Jesus did silently and, and even secretively going to this feast, not doing any open miracles, this is what caused people to think about whether Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus knew exactly how to handle this. And it got people questioning. It says, here's what it says. Can it be that the rulers indeed know that this is truly the Christ? They're like, he's speaking with, with so much grace and so much knowledge when he's an uneducated person. Is it possible that the Pharisees know that this is the Messiah and that's why they want to kill him? Isn't that interesting? But then they have a little doubt in their mind. In verse 27, they say, however, we know where this man comes from. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. I do wonder where they, they got that idea. There's nothing in scripture that specifically says that they weren't going to know where Jesus comes from. Because it actually says that he's going to uh, be part of the line of David. So I, I do wonder why this was common for the multitudes to believe that they, they shouldn't know where the Messiah comes from. But really, they, they kind of didn't know where Jesus came from because Jesus was from heaven. <laughs> and Jesus already told them all that he was from heaven. We talked about that on Thursday. We went into a lot of detail about Jesus talking about that he came down from heaven. But the, the multitudes were like, no, no, you didn't. We know your, we know your family. And this is kind of the same little doubt that they have here. They know where this man comes from. They know his family. They know Jesus' brothers. They know Jesus' mom. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. You know, a lot of times God does not work the way we expect him to work. But just because he's working differently than what we expect, that doesn't mean he's not working. So I encourage you to just trust in God and trust in the way that God does things, that it's the best possible way. Because even Jesus' brothers, they thought that they had the answer for Jesus, that he goes into Jerusalem publicly and performs a bunch of signs and wonders and miracles. But that's not how God works. And that's not how Jesus was going to work. And the way Jesus did things was the best possible way. Going in secretly, getting people to think about whether or not he was the Messiah, speaking with eloquence and convicting people of their sins. So just trust in God, even if you don't necessarily see him working, working signs and wonders and miracles and whatever else, that does not mean he's not working in your life. He certainly is, and he is doing it the best possible way that he knows will work. 
I hope you guys are enjoying the weather where you're at. It is currently snowing right now. And I arranged my desk recently to, uh, to face almost outside, which is awesome because it just looks so pretty. I just love seeing all the little snow coming down. But guys, I'd love to get to know all of you. Tell me what the weather is where you live. And also tell me your name. And feel free to always reach out if you have a prayer request or something that you just, you know, are struggling with or whatever that you want me to pray for. Just send me an email and I will write you down in my little prayer journal. Faithful listeners, don't forget to go over to the YouTube channel because I have a video that is coming out. And it's a fun one and kind of controversial about worship music. So that'll be fun. But faithful listeners, I will see you all bright and early tomorrow for an episode out of Deuteronomy. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy listening and God bless.